Uh, today we'll be speaking to Hein Ho, uh, who represents uh, Fujifilm South Africa, and we'll be speaking to uh, Fujifilm ex-photographer uh, John Armstrong. Um, so I'm just going to minimize uh, the, uh, the screen now. Okay, good morning, good morning. Uh, I'd like to bring in Hein. Hein, are you there? Good morning. Yes, I'm here. Hein, how are you doing? Yes, what are you, Mark? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you yeah, so much yeah. for, for coming on board this morning. Uh, we're super excited. How are you? No, very, very well. Thank you for having us, Mark. Cool. So I just wanted to let some of the students know just how long our relationship has been going. It's been going for about five years or so. Yes. Um, and uh, we used to have a couple of workshops with Fuji. You guys used to come out. Um, so w would you like to let the students know just um, what Fujifilm South Africa uh, is up to? Yes. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, as you heard, my name is Hein, and uh, we We've been there about, what, five years, as you say. Yes. We had a relationship. We came there a couple of times to give a nice workshop uh, with some of our photographers. And we're excited this year to, to, to join you guys again uh, as, a, as a company to, um, to, yeah, to share our knowledge, to share our product with you guys. And, um, and uh, yeah, I would like to... Just to quickly run through with all your students, uh, what is who is Fujifilm? Uh, we basically a company that's been here for almost about almost a hundred years. Um, we are focused on um, we are different divisions. We are four different divisions, which most of you guys will probably know the um, the the main one that everybody knows now these days is mirrorless cameras. Uh, mirrorless cameras, some of you guys are already shooting on our mirrorless system, the X-T3, the X-H1, the X-T20s, the X-T30s, um, which is well known in the photographic industry. Um, but we are not just cameras. We are more than that. We are basically been for almost 100 years been making film. Um, we've made paper, we've made chemicals. You probably know the photo first, the the print shops, uh, printing on our machines. So we've been in the process of making uh, all this um, uh, photographic material that people use day by day. Mm. Um, I would like to share with you guys just uh, a, a few basic inf information on the, what our company do. Um, we are photographic, we are cameras, and beside that we are also graphics. Graphics uh, makes these big, big, massive printers that you can print billboards and that sort of thing. And then, of course, our biggest division is medical. Um, while we speak, Fujifilm is also busy uh, to um, to work with their scientists to create a, 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 a vaccine against this COVID-19. And, uh, yeah, so we're very excited not just to be involved in the camera side, but to also to be involved to improve people's lives medically as well. That's so we make, even medicine. we make even medicine, we make makeup, we make the chemicals that goes into all beer production or beer making beer. And we make uh, all kinds of uh, um, uh, chemical um, um, products um, that really enhances uh, people's lives for that. But of course, we are here today to share with you guys a little bit more about our company on the camera side. Um, what I, I would like to share with you guys three basic cameras that I uh, know that you guys as students will be interested in. Um, we've got, of course, the X-T4, which is our big newcomer, which everybody is very excited for. That's our, our 30,000 Rand camera, which is a fantastic uh, a beast when it comes to video productions and filmmaking, um, it shoots 4K, it's got stabilized body, it's got all those beautiful settings, uh, film simulations and that sort of thing. Um, then we've got just under the X-T4, we've got the X-T30. Uh, we'll share to you guys a little bit about the X-T30 as well. That is in the price bracket of about 18,000 Rand. Then we have the X-T200, 
which is more in your 10,000 rand bracket. So we are looking at a 10,000 rand good camera that can do video, can do professional photography and everything. Uh, you will look at the X-T30, which is about an 18,000 to 20,000 rand price bracket. And then, of course, the X-T4, which is a 30,000 rand bracket. Mm. That's, that's, so, a, that's um, really good value, uh, 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 Hein. I mean, um, then if students wanted to obviously uh, find out where they could pick that up after lockdown, uh, do you have any preferred uh, retailers that you'd like them to go to? Yeah, what um, the exciting news is that we've just opened last year, we've opened our showroom. Uh, we've got a beautiful showroom in Milderton Business Park, which is available for you guys to come and visit me. Uh, you can also WhatsApp me or email me, get a hold of me, and then we can literally put a demo model in your hands to go and test out for, uh, for about three to four days free of charge. Wow, that's um, fantastic. That is really nice. So, be, so before you go to the shops, uh, to the Orms, to the Camera Land, Camera Worlds, mm. uh, contact me, get a loan unit. I give you a bit of training on the system and get you familiar on the system and then you will fall in love with the camera. So just uh, before we move on, Hein, uh, I think that's a fantastic yeah. initiative. And just so that the students are aware that um, Hein has come through to the academy a number of times and um, students have been able to book out a specific model that is available. So what Hein is saying is that you can either um, go to the Milton branch uh, and obviously get some training directly from Fuji or if we arrange a, a time or a workshop once uh, lockdown is over, you'll be able to yeah. meet Hein or one of his representatives and actually get to grips with the camera at our institution as well. Hi, yeah. would you yeah. mind popping in the text box the uh, details of Fuji in Milnerton for us, please? Um, man, I don't have one here at the moment, um, but um, as I say, the best will be is to contact me and then I can uh, share with you all that information. Um, it's in Milderton Business Park, so it's a showroom, and we're also doing our graphic division there as well. So, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so everyone, if you don't know where Milderton is, you can Google it afterwards. Milderton Business Park. And then I also want to, uh, I know uh, you did mention it, I'm also a fan, is the Fuji Instax, the Polaroid camera. You can also buy Fuji. That's right. Yeah. Is that right? Cool. Yes, that's right. Awesome. Uh, uh, while you're getting that PDF up, Hein, um, yeah. students, lecturers, whoever's uh, on the board now, if you have any questions to Hein, please feel free to use the, uh, the text box, uh, which should be on the left of your screen, or put your hand up, and then I will, uh, myself or Hein, will uh, try to get to your question, okay? So feel free to use the text box if you have any questions. So John Armstrong, uh, over to you. Cool, thanks, Mark. Uh, hi, everyone. Hope you're well. Um, it's always daunting, daunting speaking to uh, students. It's probably be, uh, the toughest one out of the, out of the lot because you guys know what you're doing and you're learning really cool information. So, got to be on point today. But thanks so much for uh, allowing me to speak to you today. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm John Armstrong, as I've been introduced. I'm based in Cape Town professional photographer for quite a while. I've been involved in the film industry and in photography for about, what's it now, about 24 years. Um, that's when I left school and went into studying film. So yeah, I've been, been doing it for quite a while. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's been a, an amazing journey. Very uh, gratifying, very hard at the same time. There have been times where I've wondered why I'm in this industry, but uh, overall it's been an exceptional journey. I've been very blessed and fortunate to be part of it. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm an ambassador for Fujifilm South Africa. And um, yeah, so it's just really me. I don't know if you want me to do my full talk now, Mark, or you, you want to wait some time. I, I think, um, you know, let's, let's crack on. Um, I know the students would love to uh, hear from you. And then when we have time afterwards, we can always catch up with Hein. Okay. And, you, and can you hear me clearly when I'm speaking? I, I can hear you clearly. Cool. All right. That's perfect. Yeah, so uh, I... Uh, when I got out of school, I mean, obviously, I didn't really uh, um, pay attention enough at school, to be honest. It's one of my regrets that I didn't actually take school seriously enough. But, uh, but I was, um, I was uh, uh, pretty good at sports and I was good at art. Uh, those are the two subjects because I enjoyed them that I uh, sort of succeeded in. 
So when I left uh, school, there was obviously never going to be a university as an option for me. Um, but even if I even if I qualified for university, it wouldn't have been something I wanted to do. And then the option for a film school came up, and that was in Cape Town. I was based in Johannesburg. I grew up in Johannesburg, although I was in schools all over the country. I was in boarding schools as well. So, um, yeah, a bit of a mix sort of uh, moving around childhood, um, six different schools. But when I finished school, I was in Johannesburg. And uh, this opportunity to study film production in Cape Town came up. And that was awesome. That was uh, uh, something kind of I knew nothing about at the time, but really sort of excited me because I always wanted to create stuff. I always had that sort of in me to create. And I was always interested in films in general, always watching how they made it. You know, I never really, I mean, I paid attention to the story, but I was always interested to see, you know, behind the scenes what was going on. So I studied, I started a two year course. Um, it was City Varsity at the time. I don't even know if City Varsity is still going. It's probably it's, it's uh, in Long Street. It was by Long Street Studios then at that stage, the film studios. And uh, first year we studied film in general, like aesthetics and all the sort of theoretical aspects of it. And then second year we got to specialize. And I specialized. Um, I just got through the first year because it's very academic. I got through it just by sticking my teeth and got my projects in. But then I specialized in actual camera work. So what were we were doing is sort of anything associated with camera work. And at that stage, we were using 16 millimeter film cameras, um, as well as beta cameras, which are those really big video cameras as well. Um, those, so I was really, uh, really fortunate. I'm so grateful that I actually studied film production in the sense that I worked on film cameras. So we had to learn how to load film, uh, you know, sort of in dark bags, because you couldn't obviously expose film. Uh, all those sort of aspects that you in, you know, in photography are very, very similar to the film industry when it comes to film cameras. A lot of the same principles um, when you're dealing with depth of field, exposure, uh, ISO, because, you know, your film is one, one ISO speed. Uh, you didn't have that variation. You had to change magazines and stuff. So it was a tedious process, but I learned a lot during that time. So when I got out of study, I uh, moved into the film industry in Johannesburg. Um, I kind of put my name up in a... In a through an agency and I picked up whatever work I can. And in the beginning, it's all about brand. So most of that first year I was making tea for people on set and picking up stuff and being the last to leave set, you know, clearing up rubbish and rubbish bags and loading stuff into cars. That was pretty much my first, maybe six months or so. And slowly but surely I built friendships up within the film industry and people trusted me more and I started telling them and showing them what my experience was from an educational point of view. And then I kind of get got into the camera department. And camera department's pretty wide ranging, but it's a hierarchy system back then. You, I mean, today you get very young VOPs and camera people, but back then you had to literally wait for someone to die to take their place because there were so many, so many people in the industry. And it was a hierarchical system. You had to do your time in every stage before you got to DOP, uh, before you even got to focus pillow or clap pillow. And... So that was an interesting process, very tiring in the film industry. It's not a nice industry necessary to work in. It's long hours, you're away from family and, you know, doing ridiculous hours in the middle of nowhere, cut top things, sleeping rough, those kind of things. And, uh, but it was an amazing experience. I learned really a lot from a lot of really talented people. And um, from there, I moved to Ireland. Um, my mom's Irish. Uh, my dad is South African, but my mom's born in Ireland, so I have an Irish passport. So I decided I'd go see what Ireland was like. Um, and at that stage, my girlfriend and I, who's now my wife, so I've been with her sort of 22 years, my wife. So we pretty much met while studying, and then we went together to Ireland. And I carried on in the film industry for the first part of my stay in Ireland. But I, I, it's, again, Ireland, the film industry is very, very small. And there's so many sets and so many crews that you could be on. Um, and luckily, I had a family member who was a top makeup artist in Ireland who worked on all these top features who got me in to meet people, and that's how I started working. But it was never really a thing for me. And on the sideline, I was doing photography for myself because set principles were involved, but I could control everything. Photography was my thing. I could just determine what I wanted to shoot and how I wanted to shoot it. But I took all the things I knew in the film industry and I brought them into my photography, which was on film at that stage, 35 millimeter and medium format film. So I did that as a side thing. I did that for myself. I would do a lot of street photography, um, landscapes. Landscapes was a big thing. And um, I left the film industry because I didn't want to be involved anymore. And I took up an ordinary job. Uh, and I did sales work, um, mainly for the IT industry, driving around. So I just drove Ireland around uh, doing sales and dropping off gear and, and supplying people. So pretty cool to meet a lot of people. And it was nice just to do something different for a while. 
but photography always had my attention. And people then started buying my landscapes, buying my other work. And I was like, oh, okay, so there's, there's a market for what I do. And then that didn't really cover the, the amount of money I needed to make to make a living. So I kind of balanced both the, the sales job as well as the photography. And then at the, sort of the end of our stay in Ireland, because we wanted to come home and we got married and we wanted to start a family, we wanted to start a family close to our family in South Africa. I, um, yeah, I, I kind of uh, felt that, uh, and sorry, at that stage in Ireland, that people were starting to ask me to do portraits, shoots, as well as weddings and stuff, and I, I just didn't want to do that. The thought of photographing people was just terrible. I mean, like, what a mission. You know, landscapes, you can walk away having a bad shoot there, but you, you can't really, you can blame yourself to a degree if you haven't done the right job. But, uh, you know, a lot, of it's, a lot of it's dependent on what nature gives you. Uh, sunset-wise and sort of settings and so on. Um, but with people, there's that pressure of dealing with personalities and people and I mean, to sort of get them to do what you wanted to do. And these are all the thoughts going through my mind. So I didn't have a lot of excitement when I thought of portrait photography. But people started asking me and they started enjoying my work and then I started making more money from that than anything else. So when we decided to come home, I thought, well, here's a perfect break. I don't have a job. Let's just give this portrait thing a full go. So arriving back into South Africa, I had like clean slate to start, which is great. So um, I got into that. Um, then my our daughters were born, and that kind of uh, kind of slowed down the process in the beginning uh, for numerous reasons. They were born pretty early. They were uh, preen babies who had identical twins. They're fine today, but they're very, very small. They're about uh, under a kilo each. So that kind of had us for about six months without work. So I had to then kickstart the career again. And um, yeah, so I went into... Uh, portraiture and then weddings came up and now what I felt with weddings was is that to make money because now I have a family and um, this way I, if I can get people interested in me you know I have I can tell in advance how much I'm earning like if you get bookings you can kind of you know budget around that sort of you know that way of living and I started doing weddings and next thing I picked up a bit and then certain communities like the Jewish community and the Greek community use me and then all of a sudden, after a, a, a relatively short period of time, it kind of just took off. In particular communities, they like my work. And, you know, with, with small communities, uh, social media and so, so on, doesn't really work as well as just the trust they have in their own community. So when someone in their community says, uh, you've got to use this person, everyone uses that person. So I was very fortunate, but I'll get into as to what, what sort of skills you need to be able to do that, uh, maybe a bit later in the question section. But the... It kind of took off. So I would say, like, realistically in my photography career, maybe three years before I started to actually see, okay, I can do okay from this. I can earn a, a good living or enough living to keep the house going and the family going and um, maybe some extra perks that are involved in sort of earning a salary. And, um, yeah, it took off. And I just threw myself, like, 180% into weddings. And let me tell you, weddings is... Even though I still do weddings today, um, at a lesser degree, just because I try and balance it, which I'll also discuss, weddings is probably one of the hardest things you can get into, into photography. Probably outside of going to war and maybe being a wartime photographer. I don't know, I might even prefer to go to war. I don't just say that flippantly, but uh, some, some situations in weddings, it's, it's, <laughs> there's a lot of pressure involved. Um, family dynamics, uh, yeah, it's an incredibly tough job and you've got to have a particular personality and you've got to have a lot of patience. So I obviously threw myself 100, 180% into this, going, going, going. You know, I, I, in my busy seasons, the wedding seasons, like I, out of the seven days in the week, I might only go to bed four nights of the seven days. So I would edit through the night, through the next day, go to sleep, edit through the next day and night, and then only go to sleep the next day. So I was skipping every second night of sleep which is a bit hectic and uh, your body takes a pounding, but that's the only way you can keep up with the demand and getting a high level product to your, to your client because I edited everything. I tried options of getting other people to edit. Um, first of all, they, they can learn the skill from you and in a very short time disappear. That's one aspect, which I don't mind necessarily. I don't mind people doing that, but the reality is most of them realized uh, very quickly. They have all these ideas about editing and how great it is. But when you start editing volumes of photographs, uh, lots and lots of photographs um, that can become very uh, stale very, very quickly. So the only way I could really get it, the product where I wanted it to be and the standard I wanted it to be was to edit it myself. So I threw all my time into editing. I perfected what I liked and what I wanted to give, which I can also discuss with you if you'd like. If you want to ask questions about those sort of aspects. And, um, yeah, it's, 
it's it's it just um, it was working very well, but hell of a hell of a tiring. Uh, I mean, killing me literally, literally. Uh, like I was just family didn't see me. Like so, what happens is my kids. I get up, I do whatever I need to do with my kids in the afternoon. You know, help them with certain things, go to sports, whatever. Have dinner with the family, spend maybe a half an hour, an hour with my wife. Everyone goes to bed. I go to the office, and they'll see me again at six in the morning when I wake them up. But they don't realize that I haven't gone to bed yet. I've just worked and I've edited. So I'll be editing 60,000 photos a year, maybe 50 to 60,000 photos a year, just to make sure that my business keeps going, clients are happy, no one's getting a, a bad product or a delayed product, which affects you because as quick as you can do one in these small, in, in these small communities, as, as quick as you can do badly, one bad word about you and you'll be gone. So I was fully aware of those kind of things. So a lot of work, hard work went into it. And then I just started, to, you know, at that stage, actually, Fujifilm, that was about 2012, maybe 2013, I was one of the first purchasers of the X-Pro1. I didn't buy the X100 uh, just because I was using interchangeable lenses. And I came from a 35mm sensor setup. I moved from prime, sorry, Zoom, so I was using, I moved almost exclusively to primes, although my widest lenses were a Zoom, and it still is today. I always have a very wide Zoom. I just find the versatility because wide is such a, you know, to be able to move in quickly in certain situations, a zoom is very handy. But the rest of my lenses are all primes. And um, I then couldn't, didn't see that in the X100 because it's a fixed lens. But then the X-Pro1 came out. I was like, hmm, this is interesting. I love the sort of ergonomics, the look of the camera, the simplicity of it. And I just was, I was getting tired of the stale sort of uh, process of these modern cameras that are just very, um, I don't know, they're a bit soulless. And I was like, no, I wanted it a little bit more. I wanted to feel again. I wanted to feel my process because I've just, I'm becoming like a factory line of images. So you know, I made small changes, and one of them was changing my system. I knew very well that sensor size is not going to uh, impact my client. If I could match uh, depth of field and I could match image quality to some degree, my client viewing the image has no idea whether I'm using an APS-C sensor or a 35mm sensor. So I learned that pretty quick, and I actually learned that in when I was shooting on 35mm that it wasn't such a, it's a big deal as people make it out to be. So once we film, I understood that you know, these are the needs of photographers. They started releasing lenses and they started releasing really fast primes. And then all of a sudden I was on board and then the X-T1 came out and then I did that full change in Fujifilm said, we'd love to have you as part of our ambassador program. Um, we don't get given stuff just to let you know that um, they, it's very important for them to know that the, the people that they have in these ambassadors actually do like the brand and actually buy the brand. So I'd already bought Fujifilm stuff before they even approached me. So that was one of the processes. But around the same time I decided I was going to, sort of diversify because I couldn't carry on the, the way I was doing with weddings. So weddings still play a massive part. Like I still do a lot of weddings a year, but I kind of moved into a little more higher bracket in weddings. I was shooting sort of the, the bigger functions and massive functions, slightly more expensive weddings, uh, charging a bit more so that I could do less weddings, but, but earn the same overall through the weddings because it was killing me. But the danger is to go too high in cost, then you're not seen enough because being a wedding photographer, you've got to be seen at weddings to get work. As good as your social media is as good as your Facebook is and your Instagram is they actually don't really mean that much. It's actually being seen on the job. And the, you know, the Jewish wedding has sometimes 20 bridesmaids, 25 groomsmen, big, big weddings. Each one of those girls, at least 60, 70% of them are still be married. If they see how you operate on the day and how you are with people and your work, that's your clientele. It's not people on Instagram. So I just let you know that I know that people do use these things and they are handy. I'm a little bit of a dinosaur, but that personal interaction is exceptionally, exceptionally important. So, I um, I did kind of realize that I needed to transfer into something else. I started trying a little bit more for weddings, moving myself a bit high, not to the point where I lose work. And then I started doing other portrait things. And I made so many connections with people through the industry um, that it was it was it was quite nice that through these relationships that I built, doors were starting to open. So I do lots of different things. Like I go into I go into the bush. Um, in, in sort of in the soggy sands a couple of times a year. I, sh I just, with private families flying in, I just do all their portraits in the bush with animals behind. I do their wildlife shots for them as well. Um, after that, I'm going to big events around the world. So I'm in a plane around South Africa every second week or before the lockdown I was. I don't think I'm going to be in a plane for a while. But um, overseas is maybe three or four times a year. So I diversify. And it's very important because if there was a dry season in one of these aspects, I had something to carry me. So it's a very volatile industry to be in. But you've got to think carefully about it. And, um, yeah, so so I've managed to balance my life in a lot better way. And I'm always trying to learn. I'm trying to learn new techniques. But, you know, that, that was an important, important aspect. And I think my film background 
state of mass apart. Uh, I don't let necessarily trends around Instagram determine what my photos look like. I keep true to myself. I try to add, um, I try to add longevity to my photographs. I don't follow a particular look of a photograph because you have to understand, like back in my day when we did, had our weddings, my wedding photos were on film. And at that stage, it was fashionable to have a sepia-looking image. Um, now, if you walk into a house and you see a sepia wedding photo on the wall, you go, hmm, love your photo, but deep down, you're going, oh, you made, the, you made the wrong decision. So you've got to be very careful following trends because they're cool now, uh, not cool later. Beautiful color photographs with a bit of taste, black and white photographs. Even if you tint, tint the photo black and white a little bit, it's fine, but you've got to be careful because you, you, you're actually giving your photograph an age where... If you just keep a little bit more um, sort of traditional classic in a lot of your work, which I've been held as a strong point of the way I go forward, it gives my work longevity. So I've walked into clients' houses you know, from when I started doing weddings, and the photo still is a nice color photograph on the wall. It has, has a bit of length in it. So awesome. that's just something to, to think about as well. Um, any questions so far? Can I, yeah, want me to yeah. Keep so, uh, John, thank you so much for that insight that you've given us on your career. It's... Um, I think, uh, you know, <clears throat> going through some of your work and also seeing the video that was playing, I think um, you're quite modest. I think some of the people that you've met along the way, they're icons uh, in, our, in our modern world. And uh, those portraits are, are fantastic. I think they're quite intimate as well. It means that you've obviously built up a relationship with whoever you've uh, been able to photograph. Um, yeah. It's very insightful to hear your journey in terms of, you know, starting off in South Africa, going overseas, coming home. Um, some of the students, obviously, they're, they're going to be um, kicking their careers off now. Um, so that's very insightful for them. Uh, I have a question from, from the student, one student, uh, Kuni. He's asking, uh, how long did the post-production on your Taurus project take? Uh, to, just to comment on what you said there, and then I'll go into sure. Kuni's uh, question. Um, yeah, when it comes to photographing, uh, the reason why I believe I get to photograph quite a few well-known people, icons in business and entertainment, mm. is because, quite honestly, I, I don't view them as, there are icons, don't get me wrong, um, but I don't view them as any other different to any other client that I, I photograph. So, talking about the Taurus Project, I gave the people that I was photographing in the Taurus Project the same level of respect in my time as I did Richard Branson. Second point on that. Richard Branson is a busy man. I understand who he is. Now, when I'm with him, I am with him for a week in the year to photograph him. So I'm only allowed to show you one or two shots, but I've literally got portfolios and portfolios of photographs of him. Not just as a setup shot, but also his life, which I, I keep pretty personal. Maybe one day I'll share a bit more of them. But, but the reality is, is that I don't bother him. I understand his position. People want a piece of him every second of the day. The reason why I get repeat work, it might be because of my level of photography skill, but I'd like to say is that he's comfortable with me as that I don't bother him. I know that sounds really strange, but I've seen people come and go. So we've had videographers on the same set or the same situations with Richard Branson. It was the very short time that he's held arm around the shoulder and then when they go for drinks in the evening, they're sitting right next to him, chatting to him like he's chubby. Well, I don't see them again. Now, he doesn't act rude to them, but there's a level of distance and respect that you've got to give in situations. So I treat everyone equally. Mm. So I, the same as I am when I'm in Masi Pumaleta shooting there, Richard Branson, and I think he understands. So when he says, uh, this job, this thing's coming up, get John, he's comfortable with me. Yeah. And then there's times when he, he wants to talk to me, he comes up to me, and we sit and have a chat for a while. So I don't... It, You've got, you've got to be very professional and you've just got to understand your position and don't, and just mm -hmm. just humble yourself and realize that you're doing a job, you're not anything special, and these jobs will come. They're a lot easier that way. And then to answer Kuni's uh, question, not much because, which I can get into as well, I started in natural light shooting, as a lot of people do. I'm very lucky that I didn't have the mentality as I'm only a natural light shooter, uh, sort of hiding the fact that I haven't bothered to learn flash that much or that I'm not willing to learn more and then I, this is what I specialize in. Like there's a lot of people that have these crutches that hide behind. Some people are very good at natural life, don't get me wrong. But I um, made it clear that at the beginning I was going to learn as much as possible. And because of my film background, I had a lot of basic knowledge that I could, as my foundation. So I learned pretty quickly that bringing in flash in a particular way, and I don't do big setups. I often just have one flash. I don't even use like big setups. Like, I, I look at some of these sets that you see on the beach shooting special things. 
I look at the gear and I'm thinking in my mind, this is just where we feel you could, you could get these results without going over time and having four buses arrive with 20 people. And we overthink a lot of these things. Mm. So I knew going into Massey, for example, in the Taurus project, that if I like them correctly and do it right in production, my post is not going to be heavy. So very little post in there. It's a raw image, so it obviously needs to, contrast saturation needs to be added. But all that full light in their faces is coming from just a simple off-camera flash. And I learned two very important things when I studied film production. Um, even though it's not photography, same principle. They drummed into us on that first week. Two things, never force anything. So in those days, you, you, can't, you know, like with big film cameras, if something doesn't fit into it, just stop for a second, look at what the problem might be before you force the thing. Now, that might not be relevant today necessarily, but that was one thing. And the other thing was just do as much as you can in production to make post-production easier. So that's something I would advise you to do is really work to find a systematic sort of way of shooting that reduces that time. Because money is not made editing, money is made taking photographs, and you've got to get that balance right. Now, some jobs are compositing and massive productions for adverts and campaigns. Yes, they require a lot of editing, but often there's a photographer you just shooting and handing over, and someone else is doing that. But the kind of work that I'm doing, like, like those shots that I do for uh, uh, even Sir Richard Branson, that stuff is edited that day, and they're seeing it on a slideshow in the lodge the next morning. So everyone's very seen their work. So I do very little in that regard, but I get a lot right in production. Awesome. John, I think uh, you're singing from the same hymn sheet that we, we, we do here, and that, that advice of get it right on set, get your vision, uh, you know, uh, what you want to have happen uh, and prep for it, That's it saves you time later on, it saves you money having to pay a post-production artist or even the time that you have to spend uh, at home doing post. So I think that's yeah. very, it's very relevant and it's, it's so true.